This is MuggleCast, the Harry Potter podcast discussing everything about J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World. Welcome to episode 352 of MuggleCast. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And we are joined by one of our patrons this week, Down Under, Alex. Good morning. Hi. Where in Australia are you? I'm in Sydney. Hmm. This works out good for us because we are recording on Friday night, which is very rare for us. But uh, we decided we had to record this night because of some other scheduling stuff. So the three of us have beer out just for fun. Friday night. Why not? And what are you drinking, Alex, on a Saturday morning down there? Um, my coffee. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like in the future? It's warm. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, nothing, nothing exciting happening so far. Okay. Well, we have a bunch of news stories to talk about this week, and we're going to have a discussion on covers and additions. Another broad discussion. I'm looking forward to this. This will be fun. Of Harry Potter, of course. Oh, I thought that was, it was Twilight we were going to do, but sure, I can come up with some Harry Potter stuff real quick. <laughs> Alex, what is your favorite book in film? Harry Potter, not Twilight. <laughs> My favorite book and film are both Prisoner of Azkaban, but for different reasons. I like the book just because I like how the time turner fits in. And although the film doesn't really, I don't like the adaptation. I like the film independently as a film. Very strong, strong opinion. What are your Hogwarts and Ilvermorny houses? Um, at Hogwarts, I am a Ravenclaw. And then at Ilvermorny, I am a Thunderbird. What do we know about the Australian wizarding school? Anything? I don't think we know much at all. Mm. I'm Googling real I'm gonna, quick. I'm going to look this up, yeah. I doubt, I'm sure it was part of the schools. I don't think it's on Potter. Well, you look that up, Eric. We'll continue through this. What is your favorite Harry Potter book cover? I'm incredibly sentimental. So I like the original covers that I had, which are just the UK Bloomsbury soft covers that have the little stars around the photos, or the, the illustration, rather. They're my favorite, but... I think, honorable mention to illustrated editions because I really like those. Oh, okay. So a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite piece of Harry Potter memorabilia? You got anything cool? Yes. I have this Hedwig in a cage on this beautiful stand. Oh, damn. And it's so pretty. I got it for Christmas a couple of years ago. It sits on my bedside table. Oh, could you send us a picture of that? Like after the show? We'd love to see that. Definitely. Thank you. And finally, who is your favorite Hogwarts professor? Professor Lupin. I just like that he gave Harry a chance to prove himself rather than determining for him whether or not he could do something. I think that's yeah. a good quality in a teacher. And he was so fatherly. It was so nice. Yeah. I wish he came back to teach more. I think so. You know what's interesting? I figured out that... The Australian Wizarding School is not listed in the Pottermore reveal of Schools of Magic. However, J.K. Rowling did hint that one did exist. So I would hope so. That's, that's a whole continent. They need a school. Yeah, that's pretty weird. So she said over Twitter that the information would be revealed in due course. This was January 31st last year. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out about the Australian Wizarding School next week at the celebration of Harry Potter in Florida. Maybe. That would be She exciting. sure... Uh... Taking her time, though, I mean... Yeah. Well, there have been other promises made on Twitter that took a while to pan out. See also <laughs> the Pottermore Patronus quiz. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah but that's, th true. that's actually interesting. She specifically promised that she would be giving some information on the Australian Wizarding School. Yeah, somebody asked about Canada, and she said, keep watching Pottermore. This is last January 30th, and Dan DeBoof asked her, where do Aussie Wizards go? And she replied that same day. Actually, within a minute, that information will be revealed in due course. So I don't know what due course means to her, but uh, yeah, waiting for it. That makes me think it could potentially be involved in Fantastic Beasts somehow. I wonder. Because why More would it be in due course? Why later? Like, she never says, oh, it's coming later, unless... unless Maybe it's there's the going to be a big Australian character <laughs> in one of the future films. Uh, yes, Micah. Cool. I like Micah's response because it's coming in the encyclopedia. <laughs> well, we don't have an encyclopedia this year, but we do have 20th anniversary Harry Potter books coming out in the U.S. These have finally been announced. 
Uh, we've spoken at length already about the 20th anniversary UK books. The first one, Philosopher's Stone, was published last year because it had been 20 years last year. And now it's 20 years this year in America. So, unfortunately, we're not getting Cool House editions like I was really hoping we would. <laughs> Instead, we're getting a new paperback series all at once this summer. Is it all at once? Yeah. From the sound of it, all seven books will be released with new covers in paperback. And I wonder, though, why they're not taking the Bloomsbury approach, not from the sense of the the house editions, but why not drag it out? Why Why do all of them at one time? Yeah. I'm so glad they're not dragging it out. Like, I'm not sure. I mean, this news sort of floors me, guys. I, If they drag it out, and this is, this is true, this is what Bloomsbury is doing, is every year, every two or three years, they're going to have another 20th anniversary edition to put out. But by the time Gobble to Fire comes out, then the first book will be 25 years. <laughs> and maybe they'll have another, the promotion machine, the, the marketing machine keeps keeps rolling along here. I don't think that this is necessary at all for Harry Potter. They have a brand new author, right? A new guy illustrating all seven book covers for this release this summer. And just a few years ago, they did that with Kazu Kibuishi. And he turned out, yeah, really like cool looking book covers. But the argument then made was that, you know, obviously children have grown up and the Harry Potter book covers that they had from Mary Grand Prix, the originals, which we grew up buying and reading, were getting a little stale or a little old or new readers. You know, it was in an effort to to draw new readers in. But it's only been a couple of years since those Kazuya Kibuishi covers were released. Yeah. And for them to be doing a complete makeover of all seven U.S. books again, I'm sorry, I just don't see the point. And I'm going to have to research this for an article on Muggleland or something, but there has to be somewhere where books go when they aren't bought on the shelves. And this might be contributing to like a huge waste disaster <laughs> to have all of these, you know, unloved Kazu Kibuishi covers or just because people haven't even gotten the chance to go out and buy them. And all of a sudden there's seven new covers to buy. Yeah. I will not be purchasing these. That's what sits with me wrong. Those covers came out in paperback in the summer of 2013. We there also have the illustrated edition books coming out right now. Goblet of Fire is supposed to be out later this year. Goblet of Fire? Oh, sorry, Prisoner of Azkaban. Or what are we up to now? Oh, wait. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you're yeah. you're right. It's okay. Goblet of Fire, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait. <laughs> yeah. So, so we already have another series already coming out, and they want to essentially throw away Kazu's work, which I liked. I wasn't in love with, but I liked it, and I understood. Like Eric said, they wanted to appeal to kids again. I just don't understand why they have to redesign the whole series again already. With that said, I did see some positive feedback on Twitter, so some people are excited about this. But I just don't see a reason to get excited. And as far as we know right now, there's not going to be any bonus content within the books like the House Editions had. So, just new covers. And if we also go back to Sorcerer's Stone, didn't they have... Was it a 10th anniversary edition? or a, Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... It's interesting that at the 10-year anniversary, they decided just to do Sorcerer's Stone, but for the 20th anniversary, they're doing all seven books. Yeah. It's just a switch has been flipped, right? And and now they're in full-on money-making mode. I, I hate to sound bitter about it. I, I'm just I'm just shocked. You know, I wish we could all I wish all countries could just be more like Australia. They don't even have their own Harry Potter book cover. They just take, you know, Britain's, UK's children's edition, and that's the book cover you buy in Australia. And you know what? Those covers, which we will be talking about at some point later, were nice and fine and completely delightful. And Alex, are you a collector? Would this be something that interests you or do you have absolutely no interest in these 20th anniversary editions? I'm running out of money, <laughs> 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 which is, I guess, the most honest answer. I'm, you know, an adult now. I have to purchase these from my own salary. And I just, I'm kind of, yeah, I have to be selective about what I do and don't start purchasing. So I don't think I'll be getting these new ones. I think I'm just going to stick to 
collecting the illustrated editions and call it a day. We have a bunch of people listening live right now on this Friday night. Stephanie says, I can see collecting a large poster of all the upcoming book cover art. Buying all the different versions, not so much. I'm all set with my originals and collecting yearly Jim K illustrations. Danielle says, if it says it's the 20th anniversary edition on the cover of Sorcerer's Stone, I'll only buy that one. I bought the 10th anniversary edition they put out with the Mirror of Erised on the cover. So um, I like the idea of a poster, but let's see how this cover art looks first. Because it isn't the 20th anniversary of any of the other editions. It's just the 20th anniversary of the first book being released. So it's a little bit of a difference, right? And I don't know in the future what they're going to decide to do. What happens when you get to 20 years of Chamber of Secrets and so on? It, I really don't mind taking on some of these books and, and collecting, but I just don't see the end in sight in terms of when they're going to stop. And I want to know, really, who are they trying to market these to? Like, who is? Are they really trying to draw in new readers with these, or are these more collectors' items? That's that's what they seem to be to me. And I hope there's some new content. They should have something, even if it's a, a message from J.K. Rowling, or it's got to have an additional appeal to it outside of just being a new cover. It seems like a waste of resources to have a, a, a new artist come in and redo all seven Harry Potter books. They just did this four years ago. Here's the one way I'd be interested in these. If the covers were designed by Mary Grand Prix again, that would right. be cool. Like looking back at her work, you know, she, re okay, what am I going to do differently this time? What was like my runner up idea last time that I want to do this time? That would have been cool. Well, that was, that was the thing with the 10th anniversary edition is it was, as Micah said, it was Harry and the Mirror of Air said, but that was by Mary Grand Prix. And, and, you know, Mary Grand Prix holds a special place in, in a lot of our hearts who grew up with this series and she's still alive. And, you know, I think that it would be really great if they wanted to remake the, the books to have that touch of the familiar or that nod or that respect, but, from what I gather, and I was looking at a, a gallery of some of uh, the Harry Potter covers at one of the most recent, not sure if it was Leaky Cons or what, but, you know, the relationship that Scholastic had with these artists has changed over time. And I think that there may be some political or contractual things that might be going on, which may explain why there are no longer books printed with Mary Grand Prix's art or with Co the, the reason they're cycling through this so so often or something i i don't know maybe maybe scholastic doesn't want to give mary grand prix any more money <laughs> oh god well wait a second i was just gonna say they do still publish the hardback edition with the original covers do they and i was gonna say that to their credit they haven't touched the hard covers they haven't redone those hardcover editions yeah if you like go to barnes and noble or something you can definitely get the originals well that's good yeah and I think that's admirable that they haven't changed their covers because the hardbacks are the classics. Yeah, and that's another reason why I think the illustrated editions are so popular, right? Because they're is it they're only available in in hardcover edition. Mm -hmm. and so they're big and these, yeah, they fall these apart are paper, they're going to be paperbacks. These are not hardcovers that are they're going to be released for the twentieth anniversary. And, and I was going to save this to the discussion, but we did back on episode one seventy two of MuggleCast talk with Mary Grand Prix. So I can't remember that many episodes ago, but I definitely <laughs> encourage people to go give it a listen because we did talk a lot about her work throughout the course of illustrating all seven Harry Potter books here in the U.S. Interesting. Later in the episode, like I said, we will be talking more about the book covers in general. This news got us thinking about the covers. So we're going to pick our favorites. We're going to kind of rank them. We're going to yeah. leave some for dead. We're going to draw design our own. We're going to draw our own it's verbally. Okay. Drawing hour, yeah. Yeah. So that'll be later. A little more news, though. Lots more, actually. I just wanted a little tidbit. Eddie Redmayne was doing an interview for some animated movie called Early Man. I didn't know this was a thing, but it's worth it. It's the new Wallace and Gromit film. Oh, that style does look similar. Yeah. It's worth him doing this movie because he's doing some interviews and he was asked about Fantastic Beasts, and he said it was so different from the first film, referring to Crimes of Grindelwald. There was a kind of intricacy and detail in what Joe's written that's kind of overwhelming. You begin to see all the connections to the Potter world. They come forward. 
I thought that was kind of interesting, especially that he says it's so different from the first film. Yeah. It's no longer character development or setup. Nah, well, <laughs> it's, it's even darker than before, I'm sure. Yeah. So I thought that was good to hear. And a little more Fantastic Beasts series news this week. David Yates has confirmed that each movie will take place in a different country, which is what we sort of suspected, but now it's official, official. Yeah, there was a, a tweet from J.K. Rowling years ago where she tweeted five countries out. Do you remember this, uh, guys? It was like the translate. It was one word in different languages. And there are five. Yes. Of them. Right. And it was um, America, France. So it was English, French, German, and then Spanish and Italian, I think. I that tweet to look is very... Uh, I'm sure we debated whether or not that was an indicator of which five countries. I would hope that it's more global than that, though. That's very specific to Europe. Well, and you know what? That I'm so glad you brought that up because there was a quote from David Yates. I think I read this on the MuggleNet article where David Yates was also talking about how it's a global series and a global phenomenon. And we actually got a few tweets replying us saying, well, it just does seem like Spain, Italy, England, France, Germany, America, like... Besides America, all these these films are Europe based, and we do know that that Grindelwald terrorized Europe, and Grindelwald is very specifically, I think, in the Harry Potter books, relegated to being a terror for Europe. Voldemort was the one that was supposedly threatening the whole world, but Grindelwald was just in Europe at the time. So I'm not quite sure, even though it's a global franchise, if they're actually going to represent things like Australia that we want to see. But it's tantalizing. A little bit. It'll be nice to see so many different countries. Yeah. And and I mean, Spanish could be Portugal as well, where J.K. Rowling spent some of her time and I think her first marriage. And by the way, um, David Yates also revealed this week. Did I put this in a doc? I don't think I did. The French word for muggle. Everyone ready? Non magique. <laughs> well, that's original. <laughs> Some people liked it, some people didn't. I didn't. You know. And I only heard it just when you said it right then and there. <laughs> non magique. Oh. Um, someone else said is no mag. Yeah, right. He also says the wizarding world in Paris is quite glamorous. It's quite beautiful. There's a community that lives alongside the Muggle community. It's much freer than in New York where there's segregation. Paris is a bit like England, actually, not so hung up about the differences between the two. Magical people can freely move into non-magical communities as long to, as they're discreet about their talents. So Paris is like uh, England, which is cool because I think we'll kind of return to the, the Potter vibe out on the streets. You know what is interesting, though? I, I also saw this on social media. Apparently, they instead of so they're using they're calling muggles non magique. But I think in the French translation of Harry Potter, it's a different word entirely, and in my opinion, they should have just used that word. I think it is moldu. Yes. M-O-L-D-U. And that sounds pretty good to me. Like, that sounds like it's a pejorative. That sounds like it's a an offensive term. Oh, you moldu. Moldu. Uh, yeah. Instead of non magique. Ah, you non magique. So. I like I non magique. Alex? I think maybe they've made that decision just to accommodate the English speaking audience. And perhaps they've decided against having to have a significant amount of subtitles, which I think would have been cool, actually. You know how like Mensch is like, or like there's Yiddish that's been translated into America, like, you know, a lot of Yiddish words and things like that. It will do if we see a character on screen or if Grindelwald's going around calling somebody a Muldew and that, you know, all we need is another character to go, what? And then Newt to say, oh, Muggle. And then we get it right. Like instant right. without subtitles. So when they when they had Muldew, that was translating Muggle, whereas we're talking about here the French word for non-magical person. You know what I mean? Like what? Yeah. You know how Muggle is like kind of a like slang. Like what? Yeah. What's slang for non magical being over there? And it's non magique. Given that there's a, an entire country of hundreds of millions of Harry Potter fans who grew up reading the same book series that we all did, the fact that these films should not choose to use their word is kind of absurd, though. 
So that's, you know, a little off-putting, a little weird. non magic cast. non magic <laughs> Coming soon. To I, really, I really want to do it. Bonjour. Bonjour. Welcome. So when the movie is released in November, the name of our show is going to change in iTunes. Just as a heads up, we're giving you what? About <laughs> 10 months notice? Is it hyphenated? I'm not sure hyphens will work with the uh, RSS feed. I'm... Uh... Writing this down now because that's going to be the episode title. No magic cast. No magic cast. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, we got one more news story, but first we have a new sponsor, Eric. Yeah, this week we have a brand new sponsor on MogoCast that I am personally super excited for. Uh, it's Beachbody On Demand. Beachbody On Demand is an online fitness streaming service. Gives you unlimited access to a wide variety of highly effective, world-class workouts, personalized to meet your needs. Now, I, I posted this the other day on social media. Guys, I don't know if you saw, but one of my 2018 New Year's resolutions is to lose weight and get back in shape. So over the last couple of years, ugh, I'm getting older. <laughs> We're all getting older. And my metabolism has <laughs> slowed, and I'm gaining weight in places that just weren't an issue before. But... Enter our new sponsor, Beachbody On Demand, which not only offers streaming fitness videos for every single day of their programs, but also nutritional information for meal planning. This is the part that I need even more guidance in. So I'm just beginning to browse from the nearly 60 different workout programs, all accessible on your computer, web-enabled TV, tablet, smartphone, or any other web-enabled device. Programs like the 21 Day Fix, 3 Week Yoga Retreat, Insanity, Body Beast, are all there for the choosing. And I've started with the 22-minute hardcore exercise, which is 22 minutes a day for eight weeks. So, I mean, it's awesome. Beachbody has a really great special as well for listeners of MuggleCast. You can get a free trial membership when you text. That's text. So send a text message, MuggleCast. This is so high tech. I know. You don't even need to go on a site or like log in or anything. Just text MuggleCast, all one word, to 303030. You're going to get full access to this entire platform for three. That's all the workouts and the nutritional information. Text the word MuggleCast to 303030. We really thank Beachbody On Demand for their support. I'm going to get ripped, and it's going to be great. I'm texting them right now. <laughs> I know somebody who uses Beachbody On Demand, and it's made me a true believer. Do you know what uh, program they're doing? <laughs> He's uh, currently on 80-day... 80, what is it? 80 oh, day. Obsession. 80 day obsession. 80 day obsession. Yeah. Yeah. And that is intense. These work. These really work. And it's also great for people if you don't have time to go to the gym. You work out right at home. And like Eric mentioned, you can access it anywhere. Tablet, computer, smartphone. So wherever you are, you can do these workouts. It's really fantastic. I love this texting thing. I just texted them and I got my download link. I love there it. There you go. Awesome. We thank Beachbody for their support of MuggleCast. Yes. All right. One more news story today. Some pretty exciting news. They finally revealed more information about Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery. This is one of the mobile games coming later this year. Not only did they release new details, but they released the first trailer. And it looks pretty good. Did you guys watch the trailer for this game? I did. I did. I did. What do you think, Micah? It does look pretty good. I was surprised that they went ahead and used movie likenesses of certain characters. I didn't necessarily expect that, but uh, that's not deterring me from wanting to play the game. I wish I would have seen a little bit more of the interaction in terms of what exactly it is that you're going to do, because they, they showed initially like the owl flying over, I'm assuming it's Surrey to, to or you know, eventually it's making the way. It's to your home. It was my You're getting the oh, letter. Oh. Yeah, that was your house. That's the interesting thing is they are their movie counterparts, but this is the game that's set in the 80s, right? Like, Yeah. It looks like uh, maybe a female heroine, too, uh, in this um, banner. Maybe you'll be able to choose like where you're from and who you are and, and all that as you go. But the characters, this is set in the 80s, but the characters are very much like McGonagall is wearing the same outfit we see her in on day one of Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. Right. You see Hagrid, you see McGonagall, you see Snape. So very familiar characters are are in this uh, game. I, I would give it a try. I would uh, download it, play it. Well, I hope so. We have to talk yeah. about it on the show. The trailer 
It does look like it's 3D, so I'm cautiously optimistic that this is going to be an open world type game. We'll see. There is like this one scene where people are playing or casting some spells. I wonder if you can turn the camera around. Like that would be super cool if it was an open world type of thing, but we still don't know. They also specifically mention that in this game, it's set at the same time that Tonks and Bill Weasley are still students. And because they specifically mentioned them, I'm figuring that you're actually going to run into them around Hogwarts. Amazing. What are they going to be doing? What are they going to be doing? Dating. I I forgot that Tonks was around the same age as as Bill. Yeah. Yeah, Tonks is, I guess, closest in age to them than any other R or adult, quote unquote, that they know. That's pretty cool. So, um... Looks good so far. They said you're going to be able to continually upgrade your Hogwarts student as you gain new expertise and magical skills. You can even choose your own pet. You will join one of the four houses before progressing through your years at Hogwarts, participating in magical classes and activities such as potions and transfiguration. Building your skills will come in handy as you solve mysteries and go on adventures. See, I feel like this is what Pottermore always should have been. We would collect these things and do nothing with them. Like this, it actually sounds like you're doing stuff. I was actually just going to say, like, I think this is probably one of those games where, like, there's adventures to go on and stuff, but I'm just going to stay home and raise my pet, like, in the dormitory, like, just feed it, <laughs> right. you know, just feed be a it, flop take it student out. Who only cares about the parent? Or the, well, the, about well, you the do that, Eric. I, I encourage you to uh, to take that up. I really yeah. would just want to know: is there going to be a goat as an option for a pet? Okay, this isn't Hogsmeade mystery, Micah. <laughs> it's Hogwarts mystery. Well, Hogsmeade is not that far away. It's not that far away. Maybe a, maybe if this game is successful, they will have a Hogsmeade edition where you're a proprietor of a, a certain low rent establishment and you own a goat. That might be a thing. What? Why is it low rent? I was trying to uh, come up with a quick word for trashy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tell us a how you really one. feel about the Hogshead. Well, it's described as a very seedy place where damp hay smell and uh, you don't you don't go there unless you have illegal business to conduct. And low rent was probably the wrong word in retrospect. So they also announced that they are going to be (laughs) demoing the game and doing a couple of presentations at Harry Potter Celebration in Orlando next weekend. And Micah and I will actually be there, and we are going to these panels and trying these demos 100%, and we'll have more information. And Micah, while we're there, you can stand up during the panel and just scream out, Is there going to be a goat in the game? (laughs) (laughs) I love that you guys are going down to Florida next weekend, and I love this idea of you crashing the game display please do that before he gets escorted off right universal that's, that's, property. we're gonna get one question at this panel and, and we're gonna use it on this it's gonna <laughs> oh, be yeah, great like, they're a goat you will i'm gonna act like i don't know you i'm sitting no, across i mean the way. like leaky news and snitch seeker they ask all the important questions let's just let's, uh, let's ask the real questions the answer let's ask is the that, real is there a goat or is there not a goat that's right this is a perfect example why i'm so glad we're going this year we just found out the other day that we are so we can learn about this stuff and report back Because, like I've said, I think, previously, Harry Potter Celebration has really turned into this place to break news for the various arms of the Harry Potter franchise. And if I could take a guess, I I don't think it'll be open world, this Hogwarts mystery, but I I do think that... And I didn't play Case of Beasts, but I'm pretty sure it was this way, where there's just like a lot of title cards, right? Like a lot of slide cards. The the game progresses, and a lot of games are like this now as well, where... It's an entire immersive experience, but it's not very animated. It's simply, you know, you're progressing through screens and reading. Yeah, I'm thinking you're right, but I'm going to remain hopeful for now until we see it next week. But I bet you're right. (laughs) That's what I'm thinking. I mean, it can be pretty good if done well. Yeah, at least we'll still... By the way, this isn't to be confused with Harry Potter Wizards Unite, which is the Pokemon Go style. And I guess that'll kind of feel open world if we actually have to walk around. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And there is no set release date, right? It just says 2018 for right now. I think they said spring in the press release. Okay. And if they're demoing it, I guess it's got to be close to ready. 
couple of comments here. Speaking of Harry Potter celebration, Nolan and Christina are asking if we're going to do a MuggleCast meetup, and we will try. So if anybody is also going next weekend, keep an eye out on our social media channels, and Micah and I will try to figure out a place to meet everybody, maybe at City Walk or. I mean, if you're going to the, the convention, chances are we'll run into you because we'll all be going to the same stuff, I think. But yeah, we'll organize something. They will be wearing giant lion's heads as well. Yeah. No, we won't. Uh, Can't miss them. We'll meet you at the Hogshead. How about that? <laughs> oh, no, that's too, that's too low rent for Eric. Well, he won't be I, there. You know what? I looked it up, <laughs> and the second definition on Google says having little prestige, inferior, or shoddy. So shoddy. There, <laughs> there we go. I used the right word. And uh, before we get to our main discussion one more remark here uh jen who's listening live says beach body on demand is amaze balls i started a new round last week and i'm already down seven pounds wow go jen that's impressive i'm quitting right now on uh, this episode right now getting on the app just kidding let's get into our covers and editions discussion so like i said because of the 20th anniversary editions coming out and new covers being released we thought let's look back at the original covers have another general discussion. I don't think we've ever just chatted about the covers, and we came up with a couple of fun ways to do it. You know, you know what I want to talk before we get into like which covers are our favorites. I thought it'd be interesting just to talk. I know it's a little bit further down in the document, but like about what scenes were captured right in each book. Does that make sense to talk about now, or should we do that later? We can do it now. Sure. Yeah, because um, as you go through the series, and uh, Alex, I know, you know, like with the UK editions too, it's interesting to see because certain books have the same exact scene, you know, across editions, obviously illustrated differently, and then other ones have sort of completely different scenes. So, for instance, just going between the US and the UK, the first Harry Potter book in the US has Harry presumably on the Quidditch pitch or you know, around the stone, like he's underneath a stone archway, which we can assume to be at Hogwarts, and he's about to catch the golden snitch. He's playing Quidditch in the U.S. edition. But in the U.K. edition, he's on platform nine and three quarters, and there's the Hogwarts Express and some owls and his cage, and ultimately two different, two very different covers that are meant to show the beginning of a journey, which actually I think in terms of showing you the beginning of a journey – the UK edition may win out. Yes. Whereas Sorcerer's Stone is kind of a best of because you also have the unicorn in the background, you got Fluffy in the background, and you can also see Hogwarts. Oh, yeah. So Mary Grand Prix did kind of like a montage, right? and then uh, Malgum? Is that the right word? I'm going to look that up. I would say that Mary Grand Prix does a lot of that, though. If you look throughout the yeah. covers as you go through Sorcerer's Stone to Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire... And maybe that's really where it kind of stops, but there's a lot of detail, a lot of detail in the work that she does. A lot of Easter eggs, I would call them, and tying back into the different plot lines of those specific books. Whereas it seems to me, and, and again, I'm only looking at the front covers here of the UK editions, but it seems like it's a single scene, right? So it's the Hogwarts Express, then the Fort Anglia, then the hippogriff and the battle and the first task of the Triwizard tournament. I don't know for me, for the first book, at least I would, I would vote for the UK edition. I actually think it's a better representation of what you're about to get into. I just really like Harry's face in that UK edition. Cause he's like, Ooh, what's this? <laughs> a train? <laughs> he looks it like he's 40 I, uh... though. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh my he does look old. Maybe he has Benjamin Button disease, dude. So I thought we could be a little savage during this portion where we're looking at each one to intro them. Let's each decide which one is better, U.S. versus U.K. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to say the U.K. one is better just because I like the start of the journey with the train. Yeah. I'm not always going to favor the U.S. covers, I promise, but I think U.S. cover Sorcerer's Stone for sure. Micah? Yeah, I would just go back to what I was saying earlier. I I think for the start of this entire series, the UK edition wins out for me. Wow. Even though Harry actually looks 11 in the US version. Look, 11 is the new 40, 40 is the new 11. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, well, let's talk about book two. Book two is well, actually on, a huge. Alex, how about you? Which? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I like the UK edition. Okay. Oh, wow. So that one okay. won that time, I think. Singled out. The US book two though is definitely a spoiler. I think. I mean, maybe Harry is holding on to Fox, and there's a shriveled snake skin on the chamber floor, and he's rising up and basically being carried out of the chamber. We know that this takes place after Harry has defeated Voldemort for a second time, or Tom Riddle, you know, Jr., as it were. When I was 14 years old, I took one look at this cover, and I said, oh my gosh, he killed a Horcrux. (laughs) That means he's going to defeat Voldemort in book seven. Spoiled. Everything. Ruined. So, I mean, it is sort of colorful. Like, the red is actually a good contrast. Like, it's the red of Fox, but then also sort of like blood on the chamber walls that say that makes out the words and the chamber of secrets. So like, that's kind of cool, but you know what? The UK edition just has a very nice sky blue vehicle and Harry and Ron are in there. And so is Hedwig. And it's kind of, I don't know, very lofty and very peaceful. Which ended up being brought over to the U S many years later for the illustrated edition. That's right. But there it's part of the borough, isn't it? Yeah, there's a huge borough. I was gonna say that's mostly the borough. Yeah. And true. the color scheme is more orange. But um yeah, so two different scenes obviously, but book two in the UK, again, going on a journey, going on, you know, travel, transit seems to somehow be this this huge recurring theme for the UK artist. I prefer the US edition here because you also open this cover up. And you see Hermione and Lockhart on the back, right? Oh, I haven't, I don't recall for sure. I know some of, even the UK editions do have, like, Prisoner of Azkaban has more of the castle, I think. And Philosopher's Stone has a man whose identity is initially very heavily debated, but eventually had Dumbledore. Okay, so I'm wrong. It's it's Hermione and Ron on the back of Harry. You don't <laughs> see um, Lockhart. Okay. So you think that the U.S. edition of Chamber of Secrets is a better cover? Yeah, just because you open it up and it's kind of a surprise. Oh, there they are on the back. (laughs) And plus Fox. Okay. I'm going to go with UK because the flying car, I mean, it's not, even that's a little bit of a spoiler, but I just think it's real, real special and represents uh, a magically enchanted muggle item. I really love the color blue. I'll agree with Andrew and... uh, (laughs) You guys are ganging up on me. I like the uh, U.S. edition of, of Chamber of Secrets. Actually, for the reasons that you mentioned earlier, Eric, is sort of being spoilery, but you got the writing on the wall, similar to how the message is left in the book. You know, Fox. I don't know. This is the U.K. cover. I do like it, but it's just, I don't know. Alex, can you bring us home? Can you bring us to a tie here? I, I'm torn both ways. I really do like the visual appeal of the UK cover, but you've got Chamber of Secrets and then a picture of a car. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of, I, I know the car's important to the beginning and I guess the whole story, but I just, I like that the US edition sort of plays into the Chamber of Secrets part of the title. So I think I'm going to go US on this one. You're done, Eric. It actually shows the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> yeah, just this isn't Harry Potter and the Ford Anglia of Secrets. It's the Chamber of Secrets. All right. Okay, but I, as promised, I, I picked a UK edition over a US. Got that out of the way. Your yeah. hands all sweaty. <laughs> hands all sweaty? Oh, God. The interesting thing is that, and this is funny, is for book three, which they did not come out at the same time, this was still, I think, a year apart, but they chose the same exact scene to to depict, which is Harry and Hermione flying on Buckbeak up to the top of one of the towers of Hogwarts. And on this one, I think it's clear that the UK edition is, I don't know, a little sharper looking. Yeah. It's just more, well, more detail, more detail to the, to the hippogriff. You really kind right. of... It's more of a realistic depiction than exactly what yeah. you see in in prison. I mean, I obviously look, I'll say this if I don't enough. Prisoner of Azkaban is my favorite Harry Potter book, and you better bet that the version I read was the U U S cover. And I like the shadow of Sirius Black is in the. You don't know who it is. 
Well, is it serious or is it Lupin that's in the window there? I think that's serious. Look at that hair. Look at that trend of that the U.S. editions have of actually showing the Prisoner of Azkaban and the Prisoner of Azkaban and actually showing the Chamber of Secrets and Chamber of Secrets. That makes sense. But I agree with you about sort of the, the detail, the Easter eggs, as I called them earlier. You have Pettigrew on the, I guess, what would be the inside left flap. Yeah. In the corner there. And then it looks like you have, it's hard to see and what I'm looking on my phone right now, but the Whomping Willow. And then is it a dog that's running out there? Is it a werewolf? It's hard to see. Could be anything. So, but uh, I do, I do like the UK cover better here. I like the fact that they're right in front of a full moon given. Oh, Man, Jen listening live agrees with you. That's a good point. Never thought about that. The full moon and the hippogriff looks cooler. Like I don't know what the, the I don't know what. <laughs> it's just more. It's just more. Everybody like, has a uh, an off day. It's more realistic. And yeah, I was gonna say like Buckbeak off on day. Mary How Grand much Prix's... money do you think she got paid to do these covers? <laughs> Maybe that's why they quickly went to Kazu Kibuishi then. It's it's for kids. It's it's for kids, but, but Buckbeak does look derpy on it. It's like, hey, everybody, <laughs> we're flying away. Here we go. And on the UK one, it's like, yeah, let's get out of here. Let's roll. Let's go. Full roll. moon, Batman. time to ride. <laughs> so, Ree, uh, Alex, which is your favorite? I like the UK one just simply because I like the, I guess, almost Easter egg of the full moon, which sort of once you've read it it makes that more sense and being your favorite book and now this was the cover that you read first with it or yes read it with first nice very 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 cool so we actually we got a four-way uh agreement there How about that oh wait a second i didn't what do you mean andrew oh didn't you say i thought you said you were going to agree that oh do you oh i just agreed prefer- with her observations but yes i actually do agree that i would pick the uk one here just because oh, mary grand prix is derpy buck yeah. beak but you, but you know what? Mary Grand Prix has perhaps the best turnaround in the history of ever of anything because Goblet of Fire U.S. edition remains, I think for me, I know we're getting into it later, but it is my all-time favorite Harry Potter cover. Goblet of Fire, for some reason, Harry actually manages to look exactly his age, and his smile on U.S. Yeah. Goblet of Fire is just so triumphant and gleeful and adventurous and something about the color scheme and the dragon and of course the other three champions of hogwarts this isn't so much a scene in this one as it is a a montage or collage so true yeah i think you know what i'm kind of having a flashback now i remember thinking just how it is a montage and how wonderful that is because there's just a wealth of information in this single cover and you spoke about how harry looks i think this illustration of harry became synonymous with Harry Potter on a whole. Like you would see this version of Harry everywhere. I think. Yeah. This is my favorite Mary Grand Prix illustration of Harry anywhere. And especially on a, on a book cover, it is just superb. And in contrast or in, you know, next on our, on our list of discussions, the Goblet of Fire UK edition is a very competent picture. It's actually a terrifying dragon. It is a depiction of the first task scene. And, you know, I can kind of see the struggle. I can see why Mary Grand Prix went with a montage for, for the US edition, because Goblet of Fire has, has three different tasks. Do you really want to pick one? Do you want to pick just one that is somehow significant or more significant and not sort of focus on the others? And so in doing so, Goblet of Fire, UK readers got the impression that there would be a dragon in this book, that Harry would have to face it. But that doesn't necessarily represent the book as a whole. I would say that for me, I think the UK edition is better illustrated. I just like that single scene selection. But I think that there's a lot more to be taken away from the US edition. There's so much stuff to just look at and kind of digest i guess can you imagine if we had the podcast going back in 2000 all right what are the scales <laughs> what is that th- orb thing harry's holding what dragon is is this the antipodean opali who's yeah. that girl why is his wand so darn long because of What's that, that girl jaguar behind him 
Oh, Micah. Oh, my God, Micah. <laughs> That's the most inappropriate thing you've ever said on the show. But once again, the UK edition, the Beast just very well-defined, very adult cover. I like it, but, you know, the Gobble to Fire one, for the reasons that Eric said earlier, that's my pick, US edition. I'm going to have to disagree. I like the UK one. Okay. I, I just, I'm going with the same sort of, like, reason that I used for Chamber of Secrets, which is I just think that the UK one kind of depicts a bit of the story a little bit more because most of that book is a struggle, not a victory. So I kind of like that it shows that, you know, it's going to be a book of challenges. This next one, I just absolutely adored. Order the Phoenix. This was a big one. It was. I mean, one of the most striking things about it was that she went for like a, oh God, artists are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> a certain color palette. Yeah. Template. I think that's, that's a palette. Palette. Pal- Hue. Pilates. Oh, theme. <laughs> no, was, that's part of Beachbody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all blue. And um, I just love this cover. My fa- Maybe I love it so much because it's my favorite book. Harry here is in the Department of Mysteries, but we don't know that until we read it. I love the color blue. I love Harry Potter. I love how he looks. This was the first hardcover book that I picked, or the first hardcover Harry Potter I owned was this blue Order of the Phoenix book. And um, it will indeed always have a special place in my heart. And I think it is quite awesome. I mean, if you think about the scene that's depicted, it's the Department of Mysteries. It's from the end of the book. The room is spinning. The candles are being blown out by the fact that the revolving doors spin when you get here. And there are actually, I think in the wings of the book, but also maybe in the extended covers or something, you can see other, there are other characters there. There's like a serious character and somebody like maybe one of them is Snape. There are a couple other people around Harry, which it's not immediately apparent on the jacket for the U S edition. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like, Moody, Tonks, and maybe Lupin. It's a little it's a little hard to tell who the third person is. Yeah. But I mean the bold choice of picking a color scheme or palette and using it really works well for the Order of the Phoenix. Of course, in the Order of the Phoenix being the longest book, there were probably hundreds of other scenes to choose from. But the Department of Mystery is the big climax of the book. This is where this is what it all comes down to. Harry brandishing his wand looking confident he's on a rescue mission is pretty exciting. But you know what? It's got some competition because the UK edition is gorgeous. But here's my big holdup about it. Harry's not on the cover. No, it's the he's one not. cover without any character, human character on it. I think it speaks to the fact that the book is about so much more than that. It's about more than Harry. It's about, this the order of the phoenix these people who went up against voldemort the first time yeah it's more symbolic and that's for sure to me though i think order of the phoenix us edition is where i would uh cast my vote by the way the word i was looking for is monochromatic oh, yeah. i have been informed oh. by Did my colorblind bo- boyfriend i'm not sure how he knew that if he's colorblind but monochromatic <laughs> Alex, which book do you prefer? This is where I start, I guess my OCD kind of starts getting involved with the US covers because the last three all kind of follow a theme, but the first four don't. So I really like the image depicted on the US editions because, yeah, it's got Harry in it, unlike the UK ones. But, yeah, I guess the UK one's a little plain. Like, it's pretty. It's very pretty, but it is a little bit plain compared to the U.S. one. So I think I'm going to go U.S. We could have a whole other discussion one day about the fact that only two of these covers in the U.S. were monochromatic, and then she switched back for number seven. Well, she matured as an artist. I'm going to go with the U.K. Order of the Phoenix. I actually do have a hardcover of the Order of the Phoenix U.K. edition, and it the yellow, it just, the Phoenix flame really does pop. It really does, so... I'm betraying 2003 me and everything that I stood for by saying that that's a a prettier book. Half-Blood Prince. All right. Same, another issue where, or just like in book three, book six, the both artists have chosen the same scene roughly, right? We have the Dumbledore and Harry 
cave sequence from the end of the book or towards the end of the book, just before the fateful events of the astronomy tower of note, Dumbledore and Harry are both in both covers, except in the U S cover, which we had as our muggle cast album art for a very long time. I loved that so very much that old classic, I think probably the first album art we ever had. Yeah, it was unlike there where it's just, you know, they're, they're standing over the basin and the substance is glowing back at them and they're about to to dive in. We also speculated that it was a pensive at some point, I recall. The UK edition actually has them with Dumbledore fighting off the Inferi, or the, the reanimated corpses using flame. And so I'm torn. My nostalgia makes it impossible for me to vote, I think. Well, first of all, wasn't the US edition, isn't, isn't that a pensive? No. It's just the stone basin that Voldemort has his Horcrux in. It's not a pensive. If you say because so. The, yeah, because, well, because the substance, the potion that is in there isn't necessarily memories. Is some kind of potion that makes Dumbledore relive some stuff, maybe? Wait, you can but, see inside that basin? <laughs> He's got the 3D based version. On, <laughs> based on the scene in the book, I really don't think it's a pensive after all. all. Right. I think it's just a basin. And then also on the back cover of the U.S. edition, there is students staring up at the dark mark. Now, mm -hmm. prior to this book being released, we don't necessarily know where this is taking place. It's a little bit vague. There are buildings in the background, so you can't necessarily tell that it is Hogwarts. But, you know, kind of going back to, Eric, what you mentioned with Chamber of Secrets, is this a little bit foretelling of what's to come in the book perhaps well yeah i feel like they both included dumbledore on their covers to pay tribute to get him in on a cover yeah oh, to say goodbye good point. don't you think like if we weren't yeah if we aren't if we can't feature him now we're not gonna later right yeah which cover do you prefer alex i like the uk one i think it just captures my attention a little bit more yeah i'm with you actually i'm I uh, certainly like the UK one more here. It's just an epic photo of the fire around them. It's so cool. It's pretty cool, the fire spiral. They're looking in action, whereas in the US one, they're just like, oh, let's look in this basin. What can <laughs> well, we find in here? I don't know, Professor, but I got my wand. I'm going to pick the US one. I agree that the UK version captures your attention more, but... I think the U.S. version captures the tone of the book where it's very mysterious and plodding and, you know, you have to kind of trudge through these these memories and kind of do a little bit of investigative research. And I think that more perfectly captures the Harry Dumbledore relationship in this book. I'll uh, split the vote then. I'm going to go with the U.S. edition. There we go. Last but not least, <laughs> the Deathly Hallows. Now, we really did spend a lot of time speculating where the heck Harry is and what <laughs> right. the heck he is doing in the U.S. Deathly Hallows cover. We're going to have a question. I'll just throw it in here right now. I think this is the most misleading cover. Nobody guessed that that was the Great Hall or any part of Hogwarts on the front cover. I don't think, right? And it certainly doesn't look like it's in shambles. I guess I'm like you see broken wood in the front, but like in the back, it looks perfectly fine. So I found this cover very misleading. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of, I, I seem to recall from our discussion in 2006 that, you know, we really thought he might be going back to the Department of Mysteries, that Harry might, because the columns sort of struck a chord with us. And, you know, we're like, well, is he that far underground the ministry? And is the ceiling blown off the ministry? Like, is this like really the war that we were promised here? The idea that the ceiling is not blown off and it's just inside the Great Hall is kind of uh, lackluster a little bit. I will say the best part of this cover is the curtains on the sides that are a little torn at the bottoms because it's a bookend to the Sorcerer's Stone cover, which also has curtains on the side. And those are very whimsical and pretty and not torn up. So if you put these two right next to each other, you have this complete picture of before and after, so to speak. And I just, I've never seen that before. 
I just, yeah, point. I just love that she had added curtains like she did all those years ago for Sorcerer's Stone. So almost like opening act, closing act. Right. SU, Cursed Child. I think that, uh, just going off of it, I mean, this cover did give us our second ever MogoCast album art. So props to it. But let's talk about the UK edition because the UK edition is the version that Andrew and I both received first. We were at Waterstone's Piccadilly Circus the night of the release, July 20th, I want to say, 2007. And we got this copy of the book with Harry, Ron, and Hermione in the Gringotts vault. And the what's so interesting to me is that the gold, the treasure, is flaming hot as it is. They're, t- they're touching it, and it's multiplying. And this is the issue that they're sort of spilling out of or into – or being pushed backwards through the vault entrance. And, you know, for what I think of as, as being sort of a, a more minor scene in the in the seventh book, it's by no means actually minor. And this was what the artist chose to put on the book. Yeah, um, I don't think it's a good final cover. Yeah. Mary Grand Prix nailed it. You know, it's a crucial scene. But just Harry, what you just see is what Harry, you get. And then of course on the back is Voldemort, but you know, in the curtains, like I mentioned, but this bank scene, like it wasn't necessarily very crucial to the story. It happens kind of early on. Maybe the illustrator thought that it'd be nice to get the trio together. But other than that, I don't like, I like it. I definitely like the cover, but if I'm voting for one of these, it's definitely the U S edition for the bright colors, which are just exceptional. I have to go UK with definitely Hallows. It's funny because a little bit further down, I know we're going to talk about which cover do we think needs to be redone. And and my answer to that question was the U S edition of deathly hallows. Yeah. But how can you now vote for it? (laughs) When I'm looking at these two, I agree with what Andrew said though. I think the scene selection for the UK edition, just it's random. Like at least with the U S edition, it's the end game. You're at the final confrontation and you know, I know maybe if you go back to Sorcerer's Stone, there's some form of Voldemort there, but this is the only cover that has the villain in it. So I'd have to go with the U.S. edition, even though I want it redone. I want the U.K. one done, redone, too. So there you go. Clearly, right? Alex, what are your thoughts? I guess not having had access to the U.S. covers, I just really don't like the U.S. one. I don't know what it is, and I can't put my finger on it but there's something about it that just I don't know but then having said that I'm not entirely sold on the UK version either Harry looks like he's in his 40s accompanied by two children oh Um, my god (laughs) he does look old and Hermione looks like weird she looks like a rag doll yeah I just I'm not sure I'm, I'm gonna pick the UK edition but I do have some problems with that cover as well okay Okay, well, um, that ended up taking a lot of time, but it was fun to go look at each one and vote for our favorite. I thought now we could each pick our three favorites and leaving four for dead. Order of the Phoenix U.S. Edition, UK Half-Blood Prince, and Goblet of Fire U.S. Those are my three favorites. The rest of them can get out of here. (laughs) <laughs> the rest of them can be redone. And you know what? All of them will be redone by Scholastic <laughs> later this I already year. have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're three, Eric? Goblet of Fire, U.S., absolutely. Hapla Prince, U.S., absolutely. And then Deathly Hallows, U.K. can stay. Alex? U.K. Philosopher's Stone, U.K. Prisoner of Azkaban, and then U.S. Order of the Phoenix. My car? I will also go with... Uh... The UK Prisoner of Azkaban, US Order of the Phoenix, and US Half Blood Prince. If we had to add one honorable mention outside of these 14, what would it be? I looked this up. It's been a while since I laid eyes on the art of Kazuki Buishi, who we mentioned earlier, of all of his book covers. And this was when they revealed these covers, they did like this whole big celebration across all of the entire year um, at different fan conventions and different websites each got a cover to reveal. My favorite of these now, looking at them, though, would have to be Chamber of Secrets. You get a really, really cool photo 
or depiction, I should say, of the Flying Fort Anglia, but it's uh, at the burrow. And this is what is home for Harry. So definitely 100% Kazu Kibuishi's Chamber of Secrets cover gets my honorable mention. For me, the Sorcerer's Stone 10th Anniversary Edition, which we mentioned earlier, this was illustrated once again by Mary Grand Prix, and it's Harry looking into the Mirror of Erised, and it's just so nice to see a fresh take on the book from Mary Grand Prix. Yeah, I like this a lot. You see the shadows of his parents, right, of his family, and you see his face twice because he's looking in the mirror. It's, it is a really, really nice uh, depiction, I think. Micah? I'll probably go with the Prisoner of Azkaban illustrated edition. Just a shot of the night bus on that cover. I really enjoyed all the covers of the illustrated editions, but this one in particular, I think also the fact that Prisoner of Azkaban is my favorite book may play a role into it, but I really like this cover. And Alex? I definitely agree with Micah, but I'm going to go for a different flavor and I'm going to honorable mention the UK adult editions, which are the hardcovers. They're all black with just a picture. And then when you take off the jacket, the cover's all black with gold, gold embossed stuff on it. I really like those covers. They're simple, but they're elegant. Any particular adult edition that you enjoy the most? Oh, Goblet of Fire. It's a little image of just like a simple goblet with these blue flames coming out of the top. And I think it sort of depicts better than the two we were discussing earlier. So That's actually true. If you throw the adult editions, some of them would uh, might win. I, I like the blue of the flame in the adult edition. I kind of want to buy this 10th anniversary edition now. I'm looking at a couple on eBay. Do you not have it? How much are they going no. for? No. Well, there's one for 21, one for 15, one for 35. Eh, Bill Mugglecast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all get it. Well, I'm buying one first before you guys can grab one of these. <laughs> I have okay, it. Okay. I mean, oh, you have it? Can I have yours? 10th anniversary of Sorcerer's Stone? Yeah. Yeah. So if we were to design our own 20th anniversary editions, what would it look like? Ooh. Like what alternate scene would you use from like Prisoner of Azkaban other than the hippogriff flying up or, you know, something like that? Gosh. That's a good question. This is Anybody just for Sorcerer's Stone or for any of the covers any of them so i actually had an idea why we're sitting here talking i would like to see them go back and make them all monochromatic (laughs) skip order the phoenix and halfwood prince monochromatic editions of all the books that would be so cool interesting well the um the kazu editions all have uh similar spines all the spines are the same chroma key because they make up uh, the picture a picture of hogwarts actually I think it would be cool if they went back and did Defense Against the Dark Arts Professor editions of each of the books. Oh my god, Micah. Take my money right now. Okay. Except <laughs> Deathly Hallows would still stink because it would be Bed the Caros. And they're awful. I mean, maybe, yeah, Deathly Hallows maybe maybe the one that nobody has any clue who's on the cover, but I think that could be cool. Maybe they should just do McGonagall editions of all the books, where it's just, you know... Portrait of McGonagall. Micah, you asked our patrons a question. I did ask our patrons a question. I asked them, which Potter title would you change in the Harry Potter series? So I know we've been talking a lot about the covers of each of the Harry Potter novels and what we would do to change those. But what about the titles? Any thoughts initially before we get to uh, what the patrons said? Is there any book that kind of stands out to you that you said, I really have no idea why they went with this title. I would change it. (laughs) The Goblet of Fire, to be honest, doesn't have much relevance, I think, towards the events of what's going on. It's true that this ominous goblet picks Harry's name and that forces him to compete. But ultimately, it's it's a what's the word? Deus Ex Machina, maybe or like a. It just works. It's a um, MacGuffin or, it, you know, we never find out exactly how it works or why it was hoodwinked or, you know, any of that stuff. It's just a plot device to bring about the succession of events. So I would argue Goblet of Fire would, would be replaced by something else. Maybe even not Doomspell Tournament, but Triwizard Tournament or something like that. Yeah. I mean, we know that there were a couple of different titles that were secured for 
a number of the the books prior to them being released. And I think that was mostly to keep us off the scent of what the actual title yeah. of the book was going to be. But any other thoughts, Andrew, Alex, yeah, titles you actually, didn't like? I think The Order of the Phoenix, just because Harry never really has anything to do with The Order of the Phoenix, except for the fact that he's told through the whole book that he can't be a part of The Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I tried to think of a replacement title, but Harry Potter It should have been called Harry Potter Dumb. and The Order of the Phoenix that he can't be a part of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or, or, or Harry Potter and the Too Cool Club of Non-Reckless Adults. Yeah. You know, I honestly, I don't have a problem with any of the titles. I can't really give you an answer. I just, yeah, nothing's really bothering me or striking me. Yeah. Well, I'll uh, go through a couple of comments that we got here from our patrons. Melissa Fitterer said, I would change Goblet of Fire to Harry Potter in the Triwizard Tournament. She also agreed with, uh, I guess, another patron about changing Half-Blood Prince, but I don't know what to. Order of the Phoenix doesn't bother me that much, but I wouldn't oppose changing it to Dumbledore's Army. So I think similar comments to uh, what we were saying just before. Nolan Brinkman said, I wish Sorcerer's Stone had stayed philosophers. Honestly, I think if the books were released today, the British and American versions would be identical. I like them all, but if I had to choose, Order of the Phoenix may have been better as Department of Mysteries. All the titles refer to things that are very specific to their books and don't come up again in any major way in the later books, except for the Order, which plays a big role in the remaining books. One could argue that the Prisoner of Azkaban, Sirius, is a recurring character, but he's no longer a prisoner and we know he's innocent, so that title still fits into the book-specific theme. It's good analysis, actually. All right, let's get over to some owl posts now before we wrap up the show. Hi, MuggleCast. I'm writing today because I had so much fun listening to episode 351. Back when I was 10 to 14, I was a regular listener, but then I stopped listening to podcasts. This year at 23, I started listening again. I love the throwback segment. It brought back fond and vivid memories of your discussion of the dragon cover, as well as those of my MuggleCast, specifically Eric, themed aim pictures of my middle school years. Thanks for the nostalgia, as well as for continuing to provide great content after all these years. Aim pictures of Eric. Aim yeah. pictures. Okay, Alyssa. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> I had aim pictures of Eric back in the day as well. And in my <laughs> locker. Yeah, but your name's not Alyssa. <laughs> so? Just saying. That's, I, know. I know. I think we all had aim pictures of each other. Well, I didn't have Micah, but you and Jamie. Well, Micah was elusive. He was away at college at Syracuse, and we never really – we didn't see him until we were there in the live live person. But uh, I'm glad, though, that Alyssa likes the segment that we did this week in MuggleCast history. I think it's something – you know, we're not going to do it every week, but I think it's something that uh, we'll make sure that we include every now and again on, on future episodes because it allows people to take a look back and listen, even for us, to think back to – all the episodes that we've done over the course of the last 12 years. And there's a lot of uh, things that we talked about, a lot of things we got right, a lot of things we got wrong. And and as we were mentioning earlier, episode 172 ties in well with, with this episode because we spoke with uh, Mary Grand Prix, who is the illustrator for all the U.S. editions and is never coming on our show again. <laughs> Great. After all the <laughs> things we said about her. You know, we got we got this email from a uh, Kiwi listener, and I'm wondering if Alex wouldn't mind reading it uh, since it's uh, you're both celebrating summer. Sure. So Laura says, "Hi, Mugglecasters. I was listening back to episode 270 when J.K. Rowling first announced the Fantastic Beasts project. When explaining how the movie came out, her statement included the quote: "An idea took shape that I couldn't dislodge." Having seen the first movie now and knowing the basic plot line of the rest of the series, I was wondering what you guys thought that first key idea might have been. It would have been, would it have been to tell Grindelwald's story or maybe the chance to share Dumbledore's past? Or do you think it was an idea around Newt? Love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for reading. I love your guys' show and have been listening since 2008. Laura. I remember this quote, and I like this idea a lot. That I like the idea of speculating about this idea. Yeah, I think Grindelwald definitely plays a big part. It's probably this nugget 
of an idea that got lodged in her head. I'm guessing it's how Newt Newt's story plays into Grindelwald's. Right. Yeah, because like she would have figured out a great deal of Grindelwald's backstory when writing not only that bit that appears on the frog card in book one, but for book seven with, you know, Dumbledore and, and Grindelwald's flirtation or prolonged friendship. And unless there was something particularly interesting that she hadn't previously thought up that smacked her in the face, I think it is ultimately something different that got her to writing, like actually sparked her to write Fantastic Beasts. In my opinion, it's probably the opportunity to tell a story of an outsider, whether that outsider is Jacob, whether the outsider is Queenie or Tina or Newt. They're all really outsiders in their own way. I think it was specifically this genius of an idea to set the story of an outsider in the world of the first Wizarding War. Yeah. I think it's it's tied to to Newt most likely and and how his story can help ultimately drive us to Grindelwald, Dumbledore and and their ultimate battle with each other. That would fit Eddie Redmayne's comments that you're going to start to see a lot of Potter things connect. A lot of connections are being made in this next film, according to Mr. Redmayne. Eric, would you like to read the last email? Sure. Hey, guys, it's Shiloh again. Was listening to your episode 351 and was really intrigued by your conversation about Marope and her being Tom slash Voldemort's mom. You brought up the chapter in Half-Blood Prince called The House of Gaunt. But I remembered the chapter, The Secret Riddle, to be much more revealing into Marope as a mother. I remember being shocked she died in childbirth because she was a witch. Taken from the Half-Blood Prince chapter 13 entitled The Secret Riddle. In any case, as you are about to see, Marope refuses to raise her wand even to save her own life. She wouldn't even stay alive for her son? Dumbledore raised his eyebrows. Could you possibly be feeling sorry for the Lord Voldemort? No, said Harry quickly. But she had a choice, didn't she? Not like my mother. Your mother had a choice too, said Dumbledore gently. Yes, Marope Riddle chose death in spite of a son who needed her, but do not judge her too harshly, Harry. She was greatly weakened by long suffering. She never had your mother's courage. Marope chose death over fighting to survive through pain to raise her child, whereas Lily chose to sacrifice herself out of intense love to save her child. I feel like Marope and Lily are parallels. Both died, but for different purposes, and shows not only the connection that Voldemort has made through the killing curse, but maybe even before all of that, before they all were connected in a weird way. Both their mothers had died, one in choosing to run towards pain to spare her son, and one in running towards death to end her pain, not giving a second thought to her son. A life sacrificed in both, but because of how those lives were taken, shows how Harry was able to love later on in life, even though he was an orphan just like Voldemort, because Lily died for love. Whereas, maybe Voldemort was cursed in life, and could never love because Marope sacrificed herself by giving up. Maybe poor Voldy never had a chance of being as sweet as Harry. And then there's an emoji that I've never seen before in my life, which I don't know if it's like a gummy bear that's blue and yellow. I've never seen this before. Shiloh says, go Lily! Anyway, something to think about. I don't see that. <laughs> what? You don't see it in the document? The emoji? Yeah, like the gummy bear thing? It just looks like a... Uh laughing emoji yeah it's not gummy bear what oh is it okay are they tears coming from the eyes yes yeah because they're okay, laughing it looks, so i'm gonna hard. take a picture it looks way different on my screen let me tell you <laughs> it must be windows <laughs> you yeah you guys are on mac aren't what you? kind of cider I, are you drinking I, uh, just um <laughs> i'll tell you later okay okay wonderful um any thoughts on this particular parallel i think shiloh makes a a number of great points so just kind of taking a, a little bit of a different spin on on our conversation from last week, drawing out those quotes from another chapter, but I think uh, some really solid points that uh, they make. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add either. I think it was a good point. That was a fun discussion last week. Yeah, kind of sad, the idea that Marope could have saved herself, but she was just too downtrodden, too exhausted. Yeah, you know, some people, they just, you wish they could get a second chance at life. Yeah, for sure. Which brings us to Quidditch. <laughs> <laughs> or Quizitch. Quizitch. Quizitch, which brings us to Quizitch. You have multiple attempts and reattempts when competing in MuggleCast's brand new hot weekly segment, Quizitch. And uh, those who wrote in 
to answer us. In fact, I, I don't recall seeing one tweet about it, but uh, maybe that's because everyone was eyeing me, side-eyeing. It was, in fact, a trick question. Last week, to whom is Mark Evans related? The correct answer is no one. Mark Evans is that character who J.K. Rowling name drops in the opening chapter of Order of the Phoenix. Due to his last name, everyone thought he was potentially related to Lily Evans, Harry's own mother. And J.K. Rowling instantly regretted the fact that she still to this day gets emails and letters about who Mark Evans really must be. The correct answer is nobody. So congratulations well, if come you on. did. He's not nobody. Trick question. He's, nobody. He's not important. Yeah, I mean, that that's <laughs> harsh. This is like going back to when you were talking about the hogshead earlier. <laughs> oh, okay. Look, I, I actually feel really bad for Mark Evans. He's he's not related to someone cool like Lily that we know of. We don't know anybody he's related to. How and do you unfortunately know that? he could be related to somebody cool. He's beat up by Dudley. He's a victim. He's not there's unfortunately JK Rowling did not do right by Mark Evans. Harry says to him, I know you did Mark Evans two weeks ago, meaning beat up. And it's just a real shame. You really feel bad for this kid. He could have been somebody special. He could have been a, a contender. You don't know what he grew up to be. I don't know ask J.K. Rowling. You did. You don't know what his life, say? his choices. I said, we got to ask J.K. Rowling. Oh, right. oh. I want her to answer the Lavender Brown question first. But then I don't care about Lavender. I want, then I want to know if Mark <laughs> Evans is related. Okay, based on all the information we have. I want to know if when she looks at that emoji, does she see jelly beans coming out or tears? <laughs> I, I don't see. You got to look. It looks like one of those boxing fighters in South America. You I'm, know what? All right. It, what does it's that even Friday. mean? We're, we're almost done. I just don't care. It's a Friday. Okay. <laughs> What's this week's question? This week's question. And if you've listened to the last 25 episodes of MogoCast, the answer's in there somewhere. Hey, hey, what character do we know that was chosen by all four Ilvermorny houses? Jacob. Please review <laughs> the uh, Pottermore information on the American Wizarding School, which actually is problematic, so don't. And, you know, check out maybe one of our recent character discussions where we uh, we cover this. So uh, please submit your answers to us over on Twitter, twitter.com slash MuggleCast, at Reply Us, and say, the character that we know that was chosen by all four Ilver Morning Houses was blank. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you had a good time this week. Alex, hope you had a good time. It was great. I had a wonderful time. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> when was the last time you were at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? September 2016. Okay, so you got to see Diagon Alley. Yes, I did. It was awesome. Excellent, excellent. I want to let everybody know that Mike and I will be down there next weekend. We will post some information about a potential meetup so we can say hi to anybody who's down there. Hopefully, we'll see some of our listeners. Looking Come forward to, to the that. Hogshead, 4 o'clock Saturday. Come to the Hogshead. <laughs> we'll clean it up for Eric, spruce it up, make it... An acceptable place to have a drink. A little higher rent, guys. A little higher rent. Raise the rent. Oh, Universal would be more than happy to raise prices there. <laughs> <laughs> but we will report back everything we learn about the new games. Maybe if they share some Fantastic Beast stuff, we will report back. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And we'll probably be podcasting from there in our hotel room. Oh, you guys have to try the hot butter beer if it's still there. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Done. We would love your support over at patreon.com slash MuggleCast. It's what keeps the lights on. DCs may be going off this weekend, but ours are staying on thanks to Patreon. <laughs> patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Thanks to everybody who's joining us live right now on this Friday night. Yeah, also get other sure. benefits like bonus MuggleCast. Something from this episode will be used for bonus MuggleCast. Ooh, I wonder what it'll be. Wonder. You also have the chance to be on the show like Alex was and a whole lot more. Once again, patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Alex. See everybody next time. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.